Thank you to my patrons for voting on this subject. Liquid sodium reactors have a sordid history, as many have experienced some kind of incident. A partial meltdown in Michigan would fuel the fire for the anti-nuclear movement. However, unlike many nuclear events, the dangers to the public were negligible. This is the second video in a row that involves a partial fuel meltdown, and has a fascinating footnote for a reactor design that never really took off in mainstream commercial power generation. Today we are looking at the 1966 Fermi 1 Fast Breeder Reactor Meltdown. This isn't the first time I've covered an incident involving a sodium cooled fast reactor, and it probably won't be the last. I'm looking at you, EBR1. The Enrico Fermi nuclear power plant is a generating station in Newport, Berlin, Charter Township, Monroe County, Michigan, which is about here on the map. The site is named after Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi and began construction on an experimental reactor in 1956. The site would get a second reactor with construction beginning in 1972 and being commissioned in 1988. Fermi 2 was a boiling water type reactor and a third identical reactor was planned but cancelled in 1974. Interest into the commercial use of a fast breeder reactor has led many organisations down the path of building an experimental unit and Fermi 1 was no different. The allure of a fast breeder reactor is that the use of liquid metal such as sodium does not act as a moderator like water does. The reactor type uses highly enriched fuel and can sustain a chain reaction with fast neutrons. This type of reactor can create more fuel than it consumes, meaning it could in theory solve fuel shortage issues. This is done by using a fertile blanket of non-fissile material, such as depleted uranium. However, these types of reactors have two main disadvantages. Firstly is cost, rendering the type not ideal for commercial applications. And the second is the type of coolant, liquid metal, which can become volatile when exposed to the moisture in air, meaning the event of a coolant leak could be deadly. Now that is a really, really rough and brief overview of fast breeder reactors. Let's look at the Fermi one in particular. The reactor received its sodium coolant in 1960 and achieved criticality in 1963. The reactor was tested at low power in its first couple of years of operation. Power testing above one megawatt commenced in December 1965, immediately after the receipt of its high power operating license. The reactor had two cooling loops, both using liquid sodium. The first loop passed through the reactor core and went through a heat exchanger, with the secondary loop flowing through it. The heat transferred into the secondary loop and then went through a steam generator for use with a turbine for electrical power generation. The coolant flowed upward from a high pressure plenum connected to the discharge lines of three primary sodium pumps. The sodium flows upward through the individual core and blanket subassemblies into the large upper plenum then flows by gravity to the intermediate heat exchangers and then to the suction side of the primary pumps. The plant was designed with a 430 megawatt capacity, however the maximum reactor power with its first core loading, core A, was 200 megawatts. The reactor was capable of creating 69 megawatts of electrical power. The reactor was contained in a stainless steel vessel, sealed at the top by a rotating shield plug. The core was surrounded by a blanket of depleted uranium, the total diameter of both core and blanket was 80 inches and had a height of 70 inches. The core of the reactor consisted of a cylinder of 31 inches across with a depth of 31 inches. This was made up of the control rods, neutron source and multiple fuel sub-assemblies, of which were 2.6 inches square by 8 feet tall. Each sub-assembly had 140 pins of 25.6 enriched U-235, resulting in a total mass of 4.75 kilograms of uranium-235 per sub-assembly. The blanket used slugs of depleted uranium bonded in stainless steel tubes. The reactor was designed to be controlled by only two control rods. However, provisions for eight others as safety rods were built into the design of the unit. At the time of the meltdown, only seven had been installed, how the reactor had been successfully operated with as few as six safety rods. During normal operations, the safety rods were held out of the reactor core, ready to be used in the event of a scram. Out of the two main control rods, only one was used for major regulating of the reactor's power, with the other being used for shimming, i.e. fine-tuning. All the rods were of a poison-type design, employing enriched boron-10. Right, this leads us up to October 1966. In the nine months prior, a total of approximately 770 megawatts of reactor operation was logged. 
These operations include a 60 hour test at 100 megawatts. During this extended test, some temperature abnormalities were recorded, however, these were within design spec. A test was planned for the 4th and 5th of October. It was intended to measure temperatures at the reactor vessel transfer rotor in the number one steam generator and the sub assembly sodium outlets, check new pressure control adjustment on the main steam bypass line, and adjust the automatic feed water flow control system. On the 4th of October, the reactor was gradually started up to 1 megawatts to heat up the coolant to just under 518 degrees Fahrenheit. A fault in one of the steam generation valves delayed the upping of the reactor output to 1.45 p.m. on the 5th. At 2 p.m. the reactor was operating at 5 megawatts. An issue with a boiler feed water pump meant that the reactor power was reduced to 2 megawatts for 20 minutes. Once the issue was sorted, the power rose to 8 megawatts. The reactor was then put on automatic control until about 3 p.m., reaching a power of 20 megawatts. The reactor operators observed variations in the automatic control system. This problem had been experienced in the past at about the same power level and was thought to be interference picked up by the control system. The operators placed the reactor under manual control. As had happened before, the interference ceased and the reactor was put back onto automatic control for the power rise to continue. Just after 3 p.m., a staff member in charge of the operation saw that the control rods appeared to be withdrawn further than normal for this power level. Both the shim and regulating rods were approximately 9 inches withdrawn. Usually at this time the rods would be at around 6 inches. Abnormally high sodium outlet temperatures were being indicated over two sub-assemblies. At this time the power output was at 31 megawatts. At 3.09 pm, radiation alarms in the upper reactor building ventilation system duct alerted the operators. Elevated radiation was recorded in the following areas. The 6 inch exhaust line from the upper reactor building, the 3 inch exhaust line from the machinery dome, upper reactor building and machinery dome exhaust, the waste gas building valve room, and the fission product detector building. The power of the reactor was quickly reduced to 3.3 megawatts as operators scrammed the unit. The containment building was automatically isolated, although there was no one inside at the time. A class 1 radiation emergency was announced. This is the lowest in severity and management took the decision that no additional measures were required. The AEC was notified immediately. The reactivity levels and the detection of fission product contamination in the cover gas indicated that fuel melting had occurred. Since a significant amount of fuel melting could change the pressure characteristics of the core, flow tests were conducted to determine whether several sub-assemblies were substantially blocked or damaged. For the next year the reactor was inspected and many fuel elements were removed for analysis. Investigations showed that two fuel elements had melted together and a third had bent but had little internal damage. In total, 3% of the reactor's fuel had melted. The three damaged assemblies needed a lot of force to be removed from the core, necessitating parts of the reactor to be dismantled. On top of that, the two bonded elements had to be cut apart for removal. During the inspection of the reactor, a foreign object was found blocking parts of the lower plenum, starving coolant to some of the fuel elements. This was discovered by draining considerable amount of coolant and the insertion of a boroscope. The obstruction was part of six zirconium alloy panels used to direct coolant upwards to the reactor. It was suspected that dynamic flow forces caused sufficient flutter into the zirconium segments to break loose from their zirconium machine screws. However, this did not occur until a relatively long period of operation of the system. The objects were recovered in March 1968. The repair works to the core used a specially designed remote control tool capable of withstanding the radiation within the reactor. The safety confinement of the primary coolant loop contained an estimated 10,000 curries of radiation. However, this presented a problem in repairing the reactor. Although three elements were damaged, the remainder of the assemblies were still salvageable. The reactor was pressed back into service in 1970 after the repair works. However, by this time, funds had been depleted for the project and the ageing equipment meant that Fermi 1 was shut down for good in 1972. The accident of Fermi 1 was used as an example of the dangers of nuclear reactors with publications like We Almost Lost Detroit, a 1975 Reader's Digest book by John G. Fuller. A song with the same name was released by Jill Scott Heron and Brian Jackson in 1977. However, compared to many other atomic incidents, the meltdown at Fermi 1 seems pretty tame, as the confinement structure worked as it should, and no official reports of radiation release were reported. In comparison to the Waltz Mill accident in the last video, it seemed that the operators reacted quickly enough to prevent a more serious accident. 
1975, it was officially classed as decommissioned by the AEC. However, after the formation of the NRC, the definition of the unit was reclassified to a safe store necessitating more decommissioning works. In 1996, the works for decommissioning continued, however the work again stalled in 2011 with the site keeping the safe store classification. The site currently has a possession only license due to expire in 2025. It is planned that decommissioning will be continued for the purpose of removing the remaining residual radioactive material and terminating the Fermi 1 license. Fermi 2 is still in operation to this day, providing electricity to the local area. The Fermi 2 operating license expires in 2045. I hope you enjoyed the video. Do you have any suggestions for any reactor based screw ups? Let me know. If you'd like to support the channel financially, you can on Patreon from $1 per creation. That gets you access to votes and early access to future videos. I have YouTube membership as well from 99 pence per month, and that gets you early access to videos. Check me out on Twitter, and also if you want to wear my merch, you can purchase it at my Teespring store. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.